Good morning. <coughs> Sorry. My name is Eileen Johnson, and I am the Minister of Worship and Mission here at Elsa Brandy UMC. And before we get started, um, I want to acknowledge something very special. Two days ago, President Biden proclaimed November 11, which is tomorrow, as Indigenous Peoples Day. For thousands of years, Native people have walked on this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. We are gathered on the traditional territory of the Muwekma Ohlone, and we acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. Our theme this morning is holy agitation, the difficult work of grace. And so to help us center and <clears throat> think about when God is asking us to do things that are difficult, I invite you to sing this song, Stay With Me, which is Jesus's prayer when he is in the Garden of Gethsemane.
Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Good morning. Welcome to Sunday Zoom worship at Del Sobrani United Methodist Church. My name is Ken Kelly, and I will be your liturgist for today. This community chooses to worship online together to keep our church safe. If you would like more information about our church or have any pastoral care needs, please contact our church office. Would you please join me in the call to worship? What joy it is to be in worship together. We have come from very busy lives, filled both with joys and difficulties. Welcome to this place in which God will ease your burden and celebrate your joys with you. We have, we have come, come to find hope and peace in our lives. Whatever has happened this week in your life, know that God is with you and offering you peace, rest, and blessings. Thanks be to God who accepts us as we are, and thanks for the warm welcome in this service of worship. Amen. I hope you do feel warmly welcome to this time of worship together. Good morning. My name is Reverend Emily Pickens Jones, and I am the lead pastor here at El Sobrante United Methodist Church. And it is a joy to be in worship with you today in continuing our series on why are we here? And today, since we're talking about holy agitation, which I'll talk more about later, uh, we've been using sign language to help us share in our time of passing the peace. And today, we're going to be sharing a sign of peace by using the word holy. And so I'll teach you now on how to, to sign that. You put your hand out, you can pick which one you want, <laughs> and lay it flat, and then use your other hand and make uh, uh, with your fist, close your fist and keep two fingers up, your pointer in your middle, and you just move those two fingers over your hand, your other hand like this, and that's holy. So now you know. Um, and so we're going to share in this time of peace together. I invite you to turn gallery mode on your computer or your tablet, whatever you're using, uh, so we can see one another. And if you don't want to be on camera, that's okay too. You can keep it off because we are recording. So I uh, want to make sure that you feel safe and invited to this space. And please keep in mind that you are on camera. And so I say to you now, may the peace of the risen Christ be with you. And also with you.
in this time of focusing on grace um, and thinking about holy agitation, uh, this great hymn um, came to mind, God of grace and God of glory, that talks about the spirit working in our lives to bring in God's kingdom. Let us sing. The first scripture this week is found in the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and 10, chapters 4, verses 1 through 11. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast 
and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity which he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is it not this? What I said while I was in my own country, that is why I fled to Tarshish in the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would happen, what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, which you, uh, you are concerned about the bush, for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in the night and perished in the night. And should, it, should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hands from their left, and also many animals. Hear what the Spirit is saying, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. We would normally have our special music at this, uh, in this time in the service, but we're going to switch things around a little bit because I found this really wonderful hymn from a hymn society friend and colleague, John Kaur, Up, God Says to Jonah, uh, it's to, I believe, a familiar tune for us all, so let's sing about Jonah.
The second scripture this week is found in the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which was worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Our special music this morning is a text by John Bell, inspired by love and anger. This is a difficult song. I find it a difficult song. Um, John has raise some issues that probably will make us feel uncomfortable. And I hope at least will move you to ponder and reflect on how God might be calling us to move and grow and change. Inspired by love 
asks, who will go for me? Who will extend my reach? And who, when few will listen, will prophesy and preach? Amen. What an incredible song that both challenges us, but also gives voice to a deep grief that I imagine we all share. So thank you, Reverend Eileen, for that wonderful gift. This is a time in our service where we say, let the children come to me, right? Reflecting what Jesus said. And so I invite all those who are young and young at heart to come a little bit closer to the screen because this time is just for you. And does anybody know what this is? Hmm, what is this? Well, each Sunday in our worship service, we take an offering. When we're in person, before COVID, we would pass it to each other down the pews, right? Raise your hand if you think Jesus likes it when we put a lot of money in the offering plate. Hmm, do you think that Jesus prefers when you give a lot of money? And raise your hand if you think that Jesus likes it when you put a little bit of money in the offering plate. Hmm. It's an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? And that's what our story was today. The Bible says that one day Jesus went to the temple and sat near the place where the offerings were given. He sat and watched the people as they came by and put in their offerings. Many rich people dressed in fine robes came by and put in a lot of money. And then a poor widow came by and put in just two small coins. Hmm. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, this woman has given more than anyone else. Hmm. But how could that be when she put in less than the rich people, right? That doesn't quite make sense. But Jesus had more to say. Let's get a picture of this widow and see what she looks like. I love this, this version of a picture of her. All right, she's something you want to talk to her more and see what her story is. Jesus said, 
this woman has given more than anyone else. And the others, they gave up out of their wealth, right? They're rich, so they're going to give money. But this woman gave all that she had. This meant that Jesus was standing up for this woman, who may not have been included otherwise because she was poor. Jesus is more interested in what is in the heart of someone who gives rather than the size of their gift. This was a way of standing up for those that may not be able to stand up for themselves. It may not have been easy for Jesus, but he knew it was the right thing to do. I want to share a story with you. You see those coins at the top of the screen there? And I know it's a little hard sometimes to figure out how much money is when you're looking at coins. So for those adults, you could probably figure it out. That is 57 cents, right? 57 cents, two quarters, a nickel, and two pennies. And it's not very much money, is it? No, not very much, kind of like the widow with her two coins. And I want to tell you a story of a girl named Hattie. And this was from a while ago, about 150 years ago. And she gave a gift of 57 cents to her church. One Sunday morning, the pastor of a church went outside to find a group of kids, just like you, who were unable to get inside the Sunday school because the building was too crowded. One of those children was six-year-old Hattie, whose picture is on the left, and the pastor is on the right. And when the pastor saw Hattie, he picked her up and carried her into the Sunday school class where he found her a seat. He told Hattie he hoped that someday the church would be able to build a big building large enough for all the children. After a service, a couple years later, a pastor got into the pulpit like this one, and he took out 57 cents. And this 57 cents is the, the same coins that Hattie had. And she had been saving her pennies to help the church build a new Sunday school building. The pastor took the 57 cents back to his church and told everybody he could. They were so inspired by her gift that they gave faithfully until they built a new wonderful building, big enough for all the children who wanted to attend. I'm sure Jesus would say that Hattie gave more than anyone to build this church. Her heart was so pure and passionate about what she wanted to do. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Dear God, everything we have is a gift from you. Help us to remember to give back to you with a cheerful heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being at worship today. Welcome back to our series on Why Are We Here? This is our chance to reconnect ourselves to the things that ground us, that help us to stay present in our lives and with our church, wherever we are on Facebook, Zoom, right? Wherever you are watching this service. We remember that we are on a journey together on living out a faithful life that addresses real situations in our lives. I hope you've been looking within yourself and exploring this wonderful existential question of why are we here? What are we doing here? And I hope you've been learning a lot about grace. Grace is a huge component of why we're here because grace is foundational to who we are as humans, as Christians, as United Methodists. We remember that God's grace is universal and accessible, and everyone has it if you are open to it, which is an incredible thing. And today we're looking into one of the more difficult portions of grace. When our worship team began planning this series, we ended up getting into some really interesting conversations about when grace can be more tough. Sometimes grace calls us into something that makes us feel uncomfortable, out of our comfort zone, right? Uneasy or overwhelmed. 
Because maybe we have to ask ourselves if, as Dumbledore from Harry Potter says, there will be a time when we must choose between what is easy and what is right. Because being in community with one another and having grace is difficult, which we talked about when we talked about grace for others. We would like to think communities are all sunshine and rainbows, right? But that's just not realistic. We've talked about having grace for others and ourselves. It's a hard balance to have. The thing is that grace not only must be foundational, it must be authentic, right? That's a huge part of that. Otherwise, it becomes what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. For some of you that are in Bible study, you might recognize this quote. We talked about it a few weeks ago. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran pastor in the German resistance movement against Nazism. And he said, cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ, living and incarnate. Just sit with that for a moment. It's a lot to take in, I know. Because in our world, everything is an argument, right? It feels that way sometimes. When Facebook was down for six hours last week, people were making jokes, saying that we should be taking advantage of this moment while we're not spreading uh, false news across Facebook, or uh, maybe now's the time that you should reach out to that relative that you don't agree with, <laughs> right? We all seem to be in direct opposition with people that we love, people that we care about. And our country's division feels insurmountable, and so we all often have to turn away from it because it causes too much pain. It reminds me of one of my favorite cartoons. I love this cartoon. It says down there, my desire to be well informed is currently at odds with my desire to remain sane. I quote this quite often. Because sometimes we feel trapped, right? We feel like we are overcome by the world's problems. Every time we learn about some new awful tragedy or situation, we want to turn away. Unfortunately, the difficult work of grace means that we have to pay attention. Sure, we all need our breaks, and we know that because of our conversation about grace for ourselves, right? To do the difficult work of grace, we have to have holy agitation. And what the heck does that mean, right? <laughs> It means a lot of things. It means to be prophetic. It means speaking truth to power. It means recognizing the sacredness of our world and speaking for it. It means seeking justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God. It means sitting down with that person you've had conflict with so you are able to see one another and talk and see where another person is coming from, even though it can be really uncomfortable. It means tossing a pebble into a placid lake and see how the ripples disrupt the status quo. It's figuring out a way forward and taking responsibilities for how we have impacted one another, how we have caused harm, even if we didn't mean to. It's not always the easy way, Actually, most of the time, it's not the easy way. But this is the work of grace. Let's talk about an example, because I know it's a little hard to talk about these big life things when it's out of context, and so let's apply it to something. When someone approaches you, accusing you of how you have done something wrong, what is your first reaction? Say it again. When someone approaches you saying you've done something wrong, what is your reaction? It's usually fight, flight, or freeze, right? You can shut down, you can ignore it, or you can become defensive. These are all natural, instinctual feelings that we have. 
Our culture has a hard time with conflict because it's uncomfortable. And when someone accuses us of something, any of these feelings, or even all of them, it makes us angry, right, and hurt. And usually when this happens, we react instead of respond. That's a big difference, reacting versus responding. So take Jonah, for example. Oh, Jonah. <laughs> we heard uh, Ken read uh, the story and then having the song to help us understand it more. We rarely hear this scripture because it's not focused on Jonah and the big fish, right? That's the usual thing that we have about him. And God commands Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh to prophesy against it. But Jonah instead attempts to flee from God, flight, right, by going to a completely different place. And a huge storm arises, and the sailors, realizing that it's not any ordinary storm, cast lots and discover that Jonah is to blame. And that's when he gets eaten by the big fish. And eventually God commands the fish to spit Jonah out. And that's where we find our story today. Because God again commands Jonah to travel to Nineveh and prophesy. This time he goes and he enters the city crying, In 40 days Nineveh shall be overthrown. After Jonah has walked across Nineveh, the people of Nineveh begin to believe his word and start to repent. The entire city repents, and it says even the animals, which is a really uh, funny image because it says that they all wear sackcloths. And then God forgives them, and Jonah is not happy about it. He says, wait a minute, hold up. Like, you were punishing me before. Why aren't you punishing them? He does not see that this is fair. Jonah hopes that God's mind will be changed. So he waits just outside the city to, you know, see if it'll be destroyed. He makes himself a shelter with a plant to give him shade. You can see down here in this picture. And then it withers because God causes a worm to bite it. And so Jonah is now exposed to the full force of the sun. He becomes faint and he pleads to God to kill him. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? And Jonah says, I do. I'm angry enough to die. <laughs> it's a little bit of a drama queen, isn't he? Uh, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, though you didn't tend it. You didn't make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Have some accountability for yourself, Jonah, essentially. <laughs> but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? It's a powerful depiction of God's grace and mercy. And in this story, we see fight, flight, and freeze. A typical reaction when we're upset about something. And there he is, Jonah, arguing with God about it. But Jonah wants fairness and justice so that he can be pitied. But God's holy agitation does not work like that. And we have our own demons to face for harm that has been done, even if we didn't mean it. And sometimes with things that may not, we may not have done personally, but our predecessors or our ancestors have. On Friday night, uh, our church's delegation to annual conference participated in what is called a legislative session. We voted on matters appropriate to our church. One piece of legislation referred to the Sand Creek Massacre and the sins of the Methodist Church at the time. This topic felt very appropriate for this worship service and also in light of tomorrow's recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day. The Sand Creek uh, Massacre may be something you are familiar with and maybe not. To learn of this history is sobering and challenging. This is a disturbing account of history, and so I invite you to determine how to balance your ability to stay informed while staying sane. At dawn on the morning of November the 29th in 1864, a Colorado volunteer cavalry struck a village of Cheyenne and Arapahos people, which is on the Sand Creek in southeastern Colorado. 
the attack quickly deteriorated into indiscriminate slaughter. Over much of the day that followed, killing continued, and between two-thirds and three-fourths of those people who were killed were women, children, and the elderly. And when the killing ended, scalping and mutilation of the dead continued into the next day when the village was burned and the troops moved away. The events were so brutal that the entire companies of other attacking forces were repulsed by this group. Individual so soldiers and other companies simply refused to participate and still other soldiers who rode into the action were horrified by the excesses. Initially, the Sand Creek Affair was heralded as a great victory by the citizens of Colorado. And the commanding officer, Officer Colonel John Milton Shivington, was proclaimed a hero. Denver celebrated. Local theaters displayed strings of scalps on their stages, along with three small children, as trophies. News of the attack was celebrated in other newspapers, especially in the Western territories, and yes, even in California, published this great story of what had happened, this victory. But within a matter of days, a darker story emerged. Reports circulated of the atrocities that took place. But perhaps more damning was the fact that the village attacked was there because they had been promised safety. The Sand Creek attack was a violation of plighted faith and carried out by the man who was responsible for placing these people there in the first place. This is a depiction of a meeting that happened right before the massacre, where they created a peace treaty. Sand Creek effectively destroyed the Cheyenne political structure and helped to further divide the northern and southern bands of people. It was a historical trauma of profound effects that still is being Im impacting people today. And it is a symbol of failure of the United States in its relationships to indigenous people. You might be asking, what does this have to do with us? What does it have to do with Methodists? And this is an important part. First, Governor Evans, the governor of Colorado, was a prominent Methodist layperson. He was also one of the founders of Northwestern University and later the University of Denver. He was a close personal friend of Bishop Matthew Simpson and well known for his philanthropy, especially in the Methodist church. He was also responsible for the failed peace treaties. He wanted a railroad that went through Colorado and attempted to force all of the Cheyenne and Arapaho people into one small reserve. His efforts to deal with the tribes were feeble, and when trouble did arise, he panicked, and he read impending doom into every rumor and event. And so John Evans' policies paved the road to Sand Creek. And second, Colonel John Milton Shivington, the commander of the cavalry group, was a Methodist minister. And he was formerly the presiding elder of the Rocky Mountain District. He received praise for his role in other campaigns, like in New Mexico when uh, it was a, a Confederate invasion in 1862. And so he was really driven by personal ambition. And by 1864, he was out of favor with his superior officers and distrusted even by John Evans. He was the mastermind of Sand Creek. He ruthlessly planned and carried out the attack, even though he knew that the Cheyenne and Arapaho were there under promises of protection. Third, while the government and public opinion damned Sand Creek, the response of the Methodist Episcopal Church of the time was tepid at best. When the investigations began, a group of Colorado ministers publicly endorsed Colonel Shivington and his attack, and Bishop Simpson worked vigorously to save Governor Evans' job. Bishop Calvin Kingsley warned against a sentimental view of Indians offered by critics, and the Methodist press was divided by its opinion of Shivington, while strongly supporting Governor Evans. Neither Shivington nor Evans were ever called to account 
in any way by the church for their roles in the Sand Creek Massacre. The report also explores the church's involvement within Indian missions and policy throughout the area, including in California during the 19th century. In 2016, the United Methodist Church General Conference met in Portland, and I had the honor of being there. Uh, General Conference is the decision-making body of our church, our global church, and there was a ceremony of repentance for the actions of these Methodists who use their power to dominate indigenous people. Here you can see representatives and descendants of those uh, who were killed in the massacre, and they're representatives of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes. It was also a way to inform our broader church about this history that we often like to turn away from. Bishop Elaine Stanowski, who is on the left-hand side of this picture, and she was one of the organizers of this event, said, we're here to listen and to tell the truth. Gary L. Roberts presented the report, which a lot of the, where my information came from today. And he said, Sand Creek Massacre is not merely a historical relic, some moment in time to be passed over quickly because it is embarrassed or forgotten for the same reason. It's not something to be rationalized away. It touches upon issues that are as ancient as human experience itself and as relevant as today's headlines. It is a measure of humanity's struggle to come to grips with what matters. He continues, I confess as well that this study not only enlarged my understanding and perspective on this tragic subject, but it also left me with new questions, unanswered questions, troubling questions, that mean that my personal quest under Sand Creek is not yet complete. It means broadening my perspective. It means following a path of humility. It means learning to listen, truly listen. It means learning and respecting other ways of seeing. It means being a better steward of my own prejudices, fears, character, and worldview. It means realizing that I am cut from the same cloth as other human beings, past and present, and mindful that evil acts are not confined to the wicked. It means recognizing my own rationalizations and sharing my doubts." End quote. That was a powerful statement, and I remember being in tears at General Conference hearing this and wrestling with my own reactions where I wanted to be defensive, you know? That wasn't me, that was a long time ago, right? I froze in shock, and I wanted to flee. I wanted to escape that uncomfortable feeling that our church had caused such a horrible thing, members of the Methodist Episcopal tradition. And so I present this to you today, not to depress you, not to overwhelm you, but to recognize that there is a lot of work to do. And we do take steps within our Methodist tradition to try and repair harm. And we can do that within our own lives, with one another, within our communities. And even in the, if during these big events that happen that are part of our history, we continue to seek grace and it's difficult, but let's be holy agitators together, and I think we can change the world. I believe it to be so. So I hope that this information, these stories, you, that you can carry them with you and learn from them and continue to grow in grace. Amen. We do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. Hide, 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 hide. Hide, hide. 
We come now together for a time of prayer. O oh Lord, our rock, our hearts rejoice in you. Holy one, our strength rises up with joy in your deliverance. You know our every action, and you lift up those who stumble. May we be transformed by your grace. We pray that your peace would shatter the weapons of war that your justice would humble those who fill themselves to overflowing, that those who are starving now would find food in abundance. May we be transformed by your grace. We pray for lives that feel barren, for hearts that are bereaved, for all who are trapped by the power of death. May we be transformed by your grace. We pray for those dear ones who are close to our hearts, for our families, our friends, and for those in our congregation who are especially in need of your care. May we be transformed by your grace. You, Lord, turn death into life. You, Lord, turn poverty into wealth and tear down the unjust wealth that drives others into poverty. May we be transformed by your grace. When the world sweeps away those who are poor like dust and tosses out those in need as if they were garbage, 
You lift them up and restore them to honor. May we be transformed by your grace. You who establish the pillars of the earth, guard our hearts and guide our feet so we might be now and ever faithful to your world-transforming covenant faithfulness. May we be transformed by your grace. Oh God, we seek you in this world when we feel surrounded by chaos. Help us to hear your still small voice. We come and worship today to share in prayer, to have a community of prayer, a community that talks about difficult things, that has open conversations where we can be vulnerable, where we can trust one another. What a gift it is to be able to do that, even when it's hard. We lift up prayers that have been said today, and those prayers that each person has, the infinite prayers that we all have that you hear, you listen to, that you know before we do. Surround us with your love, your peace, and give us comfort in that. We don't need to know everything. We don't need to have all the answers, but we can trust in you. And to remember this, we learned a prayer from your son. We all have different ways of saying it in different words and languages, but we say it together today. Our creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We've already talked about offering today, right? But this is an important part of our tradition. There's never any pressure of giving money. There's never any guilt about it because what you give from your heart is what matters. And so we thank you for the many ways which you give in love and in peace and in grace. Let us sing together our doxology. Loving God, all that you have given us, 
we do our best to give back to you with our meager coins, with our dedication and service, with our lives that are dedicated to you. Receive them in this act of love. In your son's name we pray. Amen. And I'll share my screen. Oh, we may have it back. Please join in our closing hymn, Sent Out in Jesus' Name. Still having difficulties to say. Jesus day, our hands are ready now to make the earth a place in which the kingdom comes. Now in Jesus' name, our hands. We know that the work is difficult, this sacred work of grace, this holy agitation. And so I hope that you feel inspired to go out in Jesus' name and use the things that God has given you to make a difference in our world. Go in peace and join us for a time of fellowship after the post -lune. God bless you all. something yeah go for it <laughs>